All right, we are live. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mula. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my embrace family. And welcome to our weekly Wednesday discussion where we are going over the book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, which discusses the issue of mass incarceration and how this issue has proportionately affected um, the African American community, community, most specifically uh, black men. So, alhamdulillah, last week, uh, Sister Rashida was able to cover um, the last part of chapter two in my absence. So today we're going to be going over the first part of chapter three. And just as a reminder for everyone here, group discussion is heavily encouraged in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in this Wednesday discussion. Instead of just having me speak, most of the time it's really good to have others be talk and share their perspectives and ideas as well. So usually to do that, everyone is encouraged to, of course, read along with us every week so that we're able to best contribute to the discussion. That being said, again, you do not need to read the book in order to contribute because we do go over a brief summary of each part before we open the floor for uh, discussion. And so with that today, I'm not going to be speaking for very long. I really just want to kind of cover the first, the, basically the premise of the chapter, really the very, the very first part of it. I really just kind of take our time with this because this chapter's primary purpose is to essentially discuss how and why the war on drugs is able to discriminate against minorities, black and brown people, in an age where racism is universally condemned. It's very, you can't really be explicitly racist these, these days. And so the purpose of the shift this chapter is to one, make a case for that, that yes, indeed, the war on drugs had a discriminatory effect on the African American community and other minority communities over the white community, despite the fact that the, the, the rates are really the same, and then goes into how and why is that the case based off our current circumstances where racism is universally seen as something bad, right? Racial discrimination is universally seen as something bad. And so how is it that a system like this can prevail in circumstances and environment that we have today, of course, back in 2010? So, like I mentioned, we're just going to start with going over just like really the very first part of the, the chapter. And I really want to take some time with you guys to explain how she opens up the chapter, because the way she opens up the chapter, in my opinion, is very, very powerful. She essentially asks us to put our, she draws a picture for us, right, us as the readers. And she asks us as readers to kind of take a step outside of our own perspective and put ourselves in the shoes of two individuals, which is Arma Stewart and as well as uh, Clifford Runnell. So she starts with Arma Stewart and she kind of explains this situation in, a very, in very vivid detail. Be imagining yourself as a 30 year old single mother who has a, a two children who was arrested for uh, a, dr a drug sweep or said for a drug for drug charges that they did not commit. And while you're in this position, she talks about how you are heavily um, pressured to plead guilty for the crime, but of course you first don't because you did not commit the crime. So you find yourself thrown in jail for you know weeks upon weeks to even close far to a month because you can afford bail. And it gets to the point where you're worrying about your children, right? And she does a really good job kind of humanizing the situation for us. You have children at home that you're not able to take care of because you are in jail. You are being held against your will in jail because you can't afford bail. And you're heavily encouraged that, hey, if you want to be free, just plead guilty and we'll put you on on probation and you'll be able to to go home and you find yourself 
eventually giving in and pleading to a crime that you did not commit. And of course, what are the consequences that, that come from that? She was given, you know, $1,000 in fines. And of course, once you have that um, conviction on your record, you are going to be permanently in a second class type of status. You are not going to be able to vote in certain areas. You are going to be evicted from public housing. You are basically put in a status where you have much less opportunities than the average person due to you being pressured to um, admit to a crime that you did not commit due to all these other circumstances. And so when I was reading that part, it really just kind of, it really had a big impact on me, right? It just kind of made me really kind of question how our current criminal justice system operates. The concept of bail, for example, and she just, I don't know if she discussed the concept of bail, I think, um, in an earlier chapter, where basically if you are someone who is rich and committed a crime has a better opportunity has it easier than someone who didn't commit a crime but was accused of a crime but is not rich because they can't they can't afford bail. And so the criminal justice system does these certain techniques that force a lot of people who are who are not guilty of a crime to confess to crimes that they did not commit. And she also speaks about, of course, um, Clifford Reynolds, who was um, here in Bryan, Texas. You know, she was he was uh, she talks about how he was um, forced to leave his uh, son and his baby, uh, his baby daughter's funeral, and how basically he was forced to be a witness for a crime that he did not see, basically a drug transaction that he could claim that he did not see. And again, you were, he was held in jail for over a month um, because he was not admitting to being witness to a crime that he actually did not even he ended up losing his job, his apartment, his furniture, his car, everything. Because once he was let out of jail, all that time, he wasn't able to work. He wasn't able to pay his bills. So all of that ended up getting evicted. And so when she just, and of course, this is a very brief summary of how she discusses the situations of these two people. But when I was reading those two situations, it just kind of, again, I, when I kind of reflected upon how would I would feel if I was in that situation, it really just kind of, it kind of made me feel shivers if I'm, if I'm being perfectly honest. And then she opens with a very powerful sentence saying, this is the war on drugs. And she explains that the situations that we discussed about these two individuals are not incidents that are isolated. They do not happen every once in a while, but this is actually a very regular occurrence for a lot of individuals in poor neighborhoods and of course African American individuals. And then from here she starts discussing some undeniable facts, right? Facts, facts and figures, numbers that reflect exactly the truth of the matter, which is the war on drugs had a disproportionate effect on the black and brown community. And so she mentions a few um, numbers here. She speaks about how, you know, when the when the war on drugs gained full steam in the mid 1980s, prison admissions skyrocketed, uh, quadrupling in three years, and then increasing to a level at 2000 more than 26 times in 1983. So a pretty a pretty huge jump, right? She also mentions here. You know, I kind of want to mention this too that whites have also been admitted to a prison for drug offenses at increased rates, but those rates are much, much smaller. For them, it was like eight, around eight times the amount in 1983. So 27 times the amount for African Americans from 1983, eight times the amount for white Americans in 1983. And she discussed that you know, three fourths of all people in prison with drug offenses have been black or Latino. And so this goes into her next point. Usually when people hear that, and we've discussed this as well in, in other, other settings, usually when you hear the number of how disproportionate the number is between the incarceration rate for drug-related crimes and 
black and Latino to white, typically the thought is that, well, it's just because black people use the drugs more, right? But of course, this is um, not the case. And she speaks about this like from the National Institute of Drug Reviews reported that white students use cocaine at seven times the rate of black students, use crack cocaine at eight times the rate of black students, and use heroin at seven times the rate of black students. You know, the hardcore drug. And she also makes another reference to the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse, which reported that in 2000, white youth aged 12 through 17 were more than a third more likely to have sold illegal drugs than African Americans. As a second American. Another number she mentions is basically that overall uh, general drug use between the races are relatively the same. But even based off these numbers, it can be argued that drug use and selling drugs is even higher among whites. And despite that, we have these, these ridiculously um, vast uh, these ridiculously vast differences between in, in numbers between African American incarceration rate for drug abuses and white Americans. How do you explain that? Is really the the biggest question. Which I think this chapter she she really ex she really I think does a good job um, explaining. So right here, um, our author debunks the idea that drug use is higher among African Americans than, than whites by telling us these um, different, different statistics. And then she speaks about another reality, which I found to be very interesting, which is the fact that this idea we have of how drugs are sold, right? how people attain drugs. How do we typically see it on a Saturday morning cartoons or, or, PA, or public announcements and things of, of that nature? Right? You'll normally you picture someone in the back alley in a poor, rotten down neighborhood, a man in a trench coat, and, you're, and they're trading drugs for money, right? Our author explains that while, of course, drug, um, drug selling and drug exchanges do happen in those environments, the fact of the matter is, in reality, drug exchanges happen in basically a variety of, a variety of environments. And she speaks about how, based on certain statistics and studies, show that most of the time when people sell drugs is to other races, whites tend to sell the whites, blacks to blacks. University students tend to sell the other university students. Rural whites don't make a special trip to the hood to purchase marijuana. They buy it from somebody down the road. White high school students typically buy drugs from white classmates, friends, or older relatives. So essentially drawing a picture for us that, you know, drug selling happens on all levels um, all around. This idea that drug, sell, drug sales only happen in broken down neighborhoods is just not, not, it's just not true. Now, different types of drugs will be sold in uh, places more often than others, depending on the drugs, but overall, um, the selling of drugs happens on, on, on every level. And despite all that, she again says that black men have been admitted to state prison on drug charges at a rate that is more than 13 times higher than that of white men, despite the fact that the drug use is relatively the same or even arguably higher on um, uh, the, the white demographic. So she's throwing all these numbers at us, right? Showing us from these statistics and studies, which essentially completely refute our general understanding, our general um, thought of, of um, drug use and incarceration, right? And this just can't help make, make you think, okay, why is that? What are some other arguments someone can make against these, these claims? So from here, she speaks about um, the idea of violent crime, right? Some, are, some um, opponents may argue that, well, violent crime is higher in the black community, likely hence why the incarceration is so high. But she also um, debunks that by mentioning that violent crime, according to certain studies, is not only responsible for mass incarceration. She mentions that homeless, like, homicide convictions account for 0.4% of the past decade's growth in the federal prison population. 
while drug conviction accounts for nearly 61% of that expansion. So, of course, homicide is not the only kind of violent crime out there, of course, but just kind of give us a picture that violent crime in general has not contributed nearly as much to the growth of incarceration rates compared to drug-related offenses. She also speaks about um, the idea how, since the idea of how could that be, because the fact of the matter is that some opponents would, would argue, as she mentioned, that there are more people in prison for violent crimes than there are people who are in prison for nonviolent crimes and drug-related crimes. And we spoke about this before, but let's go ahead and mention it again because I really think it's important for us to understand this. Um, she speaks about the fact of the matter is that this creates a misconception. While yes, it is true, she says, that the majority of people in prison are those for are people for violent crime than those who are for nonviolent crimes. She kind of draws, she kind of narrows the respective floors a bit to kind of, I guess, understand that this is actually a misconception. And this, is, and this in fact, does not mean that half, that more than half of people sentenced to prison overall are people who are convicted for violent crimes. And she, and there's a very easy um, scenario to draw for us to understand this. Basically, for example, she mentioned how People who are convicted for violent crimes typically have longer sentences, correct? They're typically going to be staying in prison in a longer, for a longer time than those who were convicted for nonviolent crimes. And so she draws this hypothetical situation for us to further, further for us to understand, right? She speaks about how in a scenario you have 20 people on one side, 20 people on another side. This 20 people basically were convicted for violent crimes. This group of people were convicted for nonviolent crimes. This group of people got, let's say, 20 years in prison. These people got like, you know, two to five years. And after 20 years have passed, this same group of people are still there, right? In the meantime, this group of people, every single few years, they get taken out. Someone else comes in. It's constantly and consistently changing, right? All this group of people, they're staying in a much longer time. And so based off of this scenario, we understand that the primary reason why you see more, so our prisons are filled with more violent criminals than nonviolent criminals is simply due to the fact that violent criminals are, have longer sentences. So when they come in, they stay for a much longer time. So she says that in order to kind of debunk that argument, right? She, of course, then speaks about how most people who are under state supervision and control are not in prison. This is where she speaks about you know, probation and um, correctional control. But of course, this in and of itself has negative repercussions for those. Once you get like, like we've been speaking about for the past uh, few weeks, guys, once someone, according to author, has that conviction, they have that on their record, they're going to find themselves permanently within that second class status, right? Them being in prison is just one part of the problem. But according to the author, the, the bigger problem is like the long-term damage, right? And so from here, she speaks about the idea that the criminal justice system discriminates this is when she goes into kind of like the main purpose of the of the chapter, right? Which is to address the the question is how is it possible for someone to argue, or to, how is it possible for a system to exist that explicitly discriminates against a particular group of people based on race? We live in a time where racism is universally condemned, right? And so from here is when she starts going into exactly how this is, this is so. 
But we're going to go ahead and, and stop here. Um, this is, or at least this is as much I want to cover for, for today. And so inshallah, next week I'll go over into the, into, into the how. Today we're just going to focusing on the, on the effects and, and, and the why. And so with that, I'll go ahead and stop with my summary portion of the, the chapter. But before I open the floor, I just kind of want to share with you guys, again, some of my, some of my thoughts reading this, this first, uh, reading this premise for, for the chapter. And again, like I, I have to mention, I think the first part of the chapter had a really big impact on me, right? Because I remember back in my younger days, the concept of someone um, confessing to a crime they didn't commit didn't make, didn't make sense to me. Right? I always thought, like, why would someone convince, confess to a crime they, they didn't commit? Where, what, are, what are they going to get out of that? But when you read some of these scenarios where someone is, arrested, they're thrown in jail, and they can't, they don't have the money to make bail, and they're being pressured and pressured by prosecutors, just go ahead and, you know, confess to the crime. If you do, then we'll give you, like, this deal, and people being in those extra situations, taking those deals just to get out of that extra situation now, and then the long-term effects that come after that, it really is just, just mind-blowing to me. And it just kind of brings up the, the question, how just is our criminal justice system? Are there things that could be improved in our criminal justice system to further decrease these types of situations? Or for example, let me ask everyone this, what are, what are y'all's thoughts on the concept, of, the concept of bail? The concept of you have to pay a particular fee. Um, you don't want to be held in jail until your until you until your, until your trial. What what are some thoughts upon that? Yeah, I had I had something to say about that, um, Kenneth. Go ahead, uh, Sister Suhana. Yeah, because the concept of bail, like I've experienced it with some close relatives, and. Um, it's just outrageous because you don't even know if the person is guilty or innocent. And before they're proven guilty or any case is put up against them, they're made to pay this amount of money to get out. And it's such high amounts of money that it's just ridiculous. And you can't pay that bill, you're stuck in jail for who knows how long. So it's literally making a person guilty just because they got arrested. And it doesn't matter whether they're wrongly arrested or not so it's just a total outrageous concept it feels like it's their way of making money out of arresting people and that'll make it easier for people you know the, the police to arrest more and more people for things that probably are not even crimes you know and that's what i've seen and you know in, in many examples where you're just arrested innocently and you're paying bail to get out and you're not receiving your money back until you're proven innocent according to that justice system. So it's outrageous. It's outrageous. It's just like a money-making scheme for right. me. And, <laughs> no, and, and on top of that, that's if you could afford bail, right? Yeah. You know, many people in these situations can't afford bail. And so they're forced to be, they're forced to being stuck in jail um, until they're, until the trial comes up to where they can prove whether or not they're innocent or guilty. And it's interesting because, you know, as we all know, we're always taught ever since we were kids that our criminal justice system, the concept of our criminal justice system is innocent until proven guilty, right? But the whole concept of bail, in my opinion, kind of makes you question the truth of, the truth of that philosophy that we say that we, we live up to. Based off of how we do things here, do we really uphold that philosophy of innocent until proven guilty? So I recently had an experience when the Black Lives, you know, the George Floyd incident had happened. And um, my youngest son, Dawood, had gone off to take pictures downtown. And, you know, he's a photographer and he likes taking those pictures and he wanted to grab some pictures of, you know, the moment. And he got caught um, doing nothing wrong because there happened to be a small group of eight or nine people that were smashing windows a bit of a distance from him he was able to even take pictures of that and he got arrested and um you know he was treated like a criminal he was 17 then now he's 18 
was in, in jail for like 17 hours and um, it had to be bailed out, $700. And he said, Ami, we were treated like we were criminals and we hadn't even committed any crime. We weren't doing anything wrong. He even had his camera gear and he was telling the police officer, I've got my camera gear here, we're just photographers, but no. They didn't even check to see if they had committed a crime. They just grabbed, at that time, he was with that batch of, I think about 170 people that got arrested for no reason. So yeah, it's crazy. And he was witnessing people who were not able to bail out and were being told that they would be stuck in jail for this number of days or weeks or whatever. So yeah, it was an experience and it was it was very upsetting. Oh, is he doing all right now? Oh, he's good. Yeah, <laughs> he's doing good. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, Brother Hasi, did you want to say something? I noticed you unmuted yourself. Yeah, the same same thing. We are there. I mean, people have written uh, books on this topic, and the, there are articles that there is a significant number of people. They are behind bar without any crime. Their only crime is that they don't have money to, to, to get out. And this is a, so, so the justice is not free. If you don't have money or if your father does not have money, then we have a different uh, set of procedures uh, whereas people who have money. So this is a, a serious issue. This whole concept of cash bond is a um, is an issue. Um, I mean, we can talk more about that, but this is one of the issues we have in our criminal justice system. So, no, absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Brother Hasi. Brother Brother Lani, you wanted to say something? You wanted to continue yes. to the conversation? Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just I wanted to uh, I wanted to make a uh, one recommendation. There's a documentary. Um, if anyone has Netflix or Amazon, um, it's a story about a young man named Khalif Browder. Um, he was in uh, New York City and was arrested. Um, and his story is exactly what we're talking about. Um, people who are you know, uh, living in poverty or near, you know, near poverty who cannot afford to make bond and, and get held. And what tends to happen oftentimes is that when people spend more time in, in um, behind bars or in prison, uh, depending on the circumstance, they tend to, to uh, accumulate more charges, unrelated charges, while they're already in the system. And it makes it even harder for them uh, to to eventually get out. Uh, the other the other um, I would say pattern that I have witnessed uh, is that sometimes if it's a smaller charge, they will let the person go on their own recognizance um, initially, but then they will give them probation before jurisdiction, which means that uh, this particular charge. Um, They've, they've put the, the person on probation so that if they get in trouble in the future, that this charge can be brought back against them. Um, and so there's this system of accumulating charges, uh, lesser charges uh, against a person to such an extent that um, this accumulation of small petty crimes um, builds up into a larger uh, criminal-like behavior which leads to longer sentences and, and higher bonds and higher fines and what have you. So um, uh, to what we've all been saying, it's a system designed, especially a, uh, a stacked against uh, poor people. Uh, can't afford to fight. What's the name of the documentary? Uh, no, inshallah, I'm going to try to find the exact name of it. And if I do, I will post it in the group. Um, but the, I think it's the Khalif yeah, Browder story. Yeah, the Khalif Browder story. And subhanAllah, I, I will forewarn you, it's, it's very raw. It's 
uh, so lots of profanity and violence um, because it's you know the subject matter is is uh, basically about prison and criminal justice system. But if you can um, you know bear it, uh, it's definitely a story I think we should all watch. Inshallah. Uh, at the very least, I'll definitely have to check check that one out. Thank you very much, brother Wally, for for sharing that with us. And I think you made a very a powerful point in regards. It seems that certain aspects of the criminal justice system is are designed to keep people down, right? Are they really instead of being designed to you know punish those who commit commit terrible crimes and then we uh, what's the word um rehabilitate them to be, be able to join back society in a well where they can thrive after paying their debt it seems, instead it seems designed to keep people down especially those who are um on the lower income bracket the lower economic income bracket right sorry is there um uh, Sister Sister Rashid, I wanted to hear your opinion on uh, on the first part of this chapter. Um. Well, I, I think that you know the point is being made that it really does impact um, the poor population more so than anyone else. And I think if we kind of think about a lot of the a lot of the um, shootings of unarmed people, et cetera. And we kind of look at the conditions that those situations happened in. We're probably not gonna find that it's in more affluent neighborhoods, right? So I think that would be one thing that we could probably look a little further into. But we also know that one of the things that doc, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, was moving toward was a more of a poor people's movement, right? And knowing that 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 there was injustice mm -hmm. in poverty in in America. So, and there is now a resurgence for that, the poor people's campaign, et cetera, that is trying to go back and um, try to do what it is that Martin Luther King was planning to do next, right? Um, and I was also going to say that I had seen um, in the Washington Post there, there was an article, I didn't get a chance to read it, but basically the title was, Breonna Taylor's ex was offered a plea deal to say she was part of a quote, crime syndicate attorney says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, speaking to things. the fact that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the things that people are accused of doing are trumped up, right? So yeah, I, I, that's, that's for the part that we've covered, <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, that's all I'll say on it. Yeah, right. so it's very interesting you mentioned that, especially, oh, just one real quick, just for now, I want you to make your point, but especially the resurgence of like the poor people's movement, as you call it. It's interesting you mentioned that because the, the book that we're reading, if you notice, the author kind of, mentioned that during that transition to a poor people's movement, the concept of law and order started becoming more um, promoted and pushed within the, within the legislature, within our, within our leadership. And it's interesting because we're now kind of seeing that resurgence of law and order today, right? Kind of like at the same time that this whole concept of, you know, income inequality is starting to gain traction, the concept of law and order is being heavily pushed by certain um, political figures, right? So kind of a little bit of a, a comparison right there. Um, but Sister Fran, you wanted to, to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually talking about something a little different from what you were talking about. But when Rashida was talking, I, I got this thought process as to when something like this happens where, um, you know, there are people that are not getting bailed out or when they get out of jail because they've plead guilty, they're like second class citizens. And why is it that nothing's really happening? You know, why is this a constant situation? Like, why 
is there no change occurring? These thoughts come to my mind. And this is just something kind of small. I was thinking like when Dawood was arrested and he was in jail for a while, he had to wait for the next morning for the magistrate to give his ruling of how much bail or whether there was bail or not. Um, he was arrested with two other friends and he, he's, he, the parents of one of his friends was already there. So I didn't have to go to jail at night. They had gotten there in the morning. And he had that resource where he was bailed out with the parents help paying that money. And then I paid them later. I mean, they just did an immediate response and helped me out. He had that facility or that resource to be bailed out immediately, you know, and I didn't even have to pay the money right away. I got helped and I paid them later. And it's just, it's kind of almost as if because things are so easy for us, we're numb to what's going on to those who are truly suffering, you know, we get off so easily and so quickly. And then what's not bothering us, we don't care. You know, if it's not affecting us, it's not bothering us, things are easy for us, then we don't, it seems as if we don't, those who have resources don't care for those who really are in need. And it's just, it saddens me. It really saddens me a lot. And when I think about it, I realize that could possibly be the reason why we just have it so easy. We stop caring for others. So it's just something right. to think of. Yeah. So I actually, Sister Von Leer, I actually have a little bit more optimistic view on that than you do. It's not, I don't think it's that people don't care. I think it's more of that people do not know about these issues. Because like I mentioned, we have to understand of uh, how is the criminal justice system typically presented in the eyes of your average, of your average person, right? We make references to, you know, entertainment, Saturday morning, morning cartoons, you know, we see on TV, you know, how the news is presented. We are given this picture that the criminal justice, the criminal justice system, by and part, is mainly perfect, right? And then, and the author even talks about this. Basically, we have this idea that everyone is in jail or in jail because they deserve it. If you feel like criminal, if you are less than human, they deserve to be treated this way. And so I think it's primarily due to ignorance, right? Yeah. And I think if you had, at the very least, a very vocal, extremely vocal group of people who were educating people of the general public about these issues, you might be able to get some pushback. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, brother. Brother Lonnie, you wanted to add something? Yes, I, I wanted to because I think uh, the sister just raised a critical question, and I'm 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 almost certain the book is going to address this if it hasn't been talked about already. But um, there there's a very big financial aspect of the criminal justice system that uh, motivates. Um, I guess, law enforcement to keep the pipeline going, um, to keep people fluctuating in and out of prison or in and out of jail uh, because of the way that we fund uh, the, criminal, the criminal justice system, the penal system. So uh, basically, um, the penal system is funded based upon population and um, the, the, the state gets federal funds and loc local uh, towns get federal funds to um, house prisoners. Um, also, the prison system is responsible for producing lots of goods and products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis for uh, close, to, uh, close to nothing. It's the, it's the next best thing to slave labor when you have um, inmates creating products um, that we use every day. Uh, also, it's a, it's a big job creator in rural towns where um, otherwise there would be mass unemployment or there'd be very little employment opportunities other than agriculture. When most of these prisons you'll find are in rural areas uh, where there's essentially no other economy other than the, uh, the prison or the jails. So there, there's a very big economic aspect of this um, that 
that is the overriding motivation to keep the, the prison pipeline going. Um, so I just wanted to make mention of that. I hope I didn't um, jump in front of the discussion. No, no, no. Very, very important uh, points, brother, brother Ronnie. I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, sharing that with us. I do know that um, you're right that she did touch upon that, the author, um, briefly, I believe, in the first or second chapter. She mentioned how a lot of these, a lot of the uh, local criminal justice uh, system, prison systems, um, do these things in order to get funding from the federal government. And that does play a very major role in, in keeping this, this system going. So, all right, are there anyone else who had any thoughts to share, perspectives, questions? All right, if not, we can go ahead and end a little early. So right, right before we, Sister Rashida, you have your, your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that Sister Fahana's question or will be answered even more so in the next part of um, chapter three. She really gets into the mindset <laughs> that happens within the justice system itself um, that helps to contribute right. to the, how things happen. So. so there you go. All right, Sister, Sister Fahana, you'll get your questions answered in Sean one next week. I'll definitely read through that, inshallah. <laughs> oh, yes, good. Okay, so before we close, just again, let's, inshallah, let's keep having these conversations. And I really want to encourage everyone here, um, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. Don't be afraid to challenge these concepts. Because like I mentioned before, normally we are taught at birth that, you know, our nation our nation system is perfect it's great there's no one there's no flaws there's there's some, some minor flaws but they can be easily easily fixed if you notice something that is is wrong don't be afraid to speak out i think it's very important for us to keep having these conversations keep challenging these concepts that we normally have been um grown uh, and raised to to learn and just keep pushing to have a truly just system inshallah. And so that will go ahead and, and close. Allahumma subhanahu wa bihamdik ashiru in la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakum Allah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.